Hello my dear friends, you're on the military summary channel and today we will discuss the situation in Ukraine on the 25th of February of 2023. Today we have a lot of very interesting updates, so let's start. First, let's start with the Kupiansk front line. The Russians reported that during the previous 24 hours, the Ukrainians uh, lost around 60 soldiers, three armored vehicles, and two artillery systems the M777 Howitzer and another Krab Howitzer. The Russians reported that their continuous storming and clearing operation of these forests were difficult and dangerous to move in this area. Uh, furthermore, uh, the Ukrainians continue moving more and more forces in direction of Crimea. The Russians are saying that there is at least one Polish battalion in this area. Furthermore, the Russians are saying that more and more foreign language, uh, foreign languages, they are able to hear during the radio, uh, during the listening of the radio of Ukrainian side. So that means that the Western countries are involving more and more soldiers, volunteers, mercenaries from their side. And uh, so this is the situation that we can see right now. And when talking about the Kupians front line, the Russians report one more time, there is at least one Polish battalion in this area and their main job to hold this bridgehead and not to allow the Russians to take control over Kupiansk. Now let's talk about Liman front line. The Russians reported that during the previous 24 hours, the Ukrainians lost 180 soldiers, six armored vehicles and two artillery systems. Uh, one Grad system and another D20 system. Hobitzer. As you can see, uh, the battle for uh, Liman is still in culmination stage. Uh, I'm not sure how long the Ukrainians are able to uh, to support this level of clashes, this level of losses, I don't know. They have a lot of problems in Bakhmut. I believe that soon we are going to see uh, another attempt of the Russians to storm Uglidar and furthermore there are a lot of problems appeared in on the Avdiivka front line and the Ukrainians still continue holding very powerful army in Kupin's front line. Maybe they are planning to start someday an offensive operation but for now I believe that this this bridge hat is some kind of blast for the Ukrainians and they're losing manpower and they can use these reserves on any on some other front line, let's say on the south or near Bakhmut and so on. But they're still keeping forces here, well, losing almost every single day from 150 soldiers to 250 soldiers on this front line. Now let's move to Sivers front line. Today the Russians reported that Ukrainians took a decision to move reserves or maybe they were doing some kind of rotation process and they uh, sent a convoy of equipment and manpower in direction of Bilogorovka. The Russians spotted this uh, convoy, they attacked this convoy with artillery as a, and as a result of that attack the Ukrainians lost up to 30% of the forces that were heading in direction of Bilogorovka. But for now as you can see there are no changes in this area. Uh, the Ukrainians still controls uh, Bilogorovka, Grigorovka city Brianka and the forest uh, the, uh, that located on uh, on the north from Siversky Donetsk, no changes. Now let's talk about Bakhmut, as you can see there are a lot of interesting updates from this town. And the most important is, according to the Russian sources, they have established control over Yahidna for 100%. I expected that the Minister of Defense of Russian Federation would confirm this information today, but as you can see, they still haven't confirmed and they didn't, and they haven't included this information in their daily report. Uh, and this is about the south of Birkhovka, and on the west from Birkhovka, the Russians established control over Dubov Vasilivka. But there is one important note about this Dubov Vasilivka. The, the Russians confirmed that the Ukrainians wasn't um, defeated in this town. They took a decision to step back from this town by themselves because they understand that it's very difficult to, to protect, to defend this area. And we can say that the Russians entered completely empty town in this area. The Ukrainians moved in direction of Orekhov, Vasilivka, Grigorivka and Bogdanovka. So to, to, the Russian sources are saying that uh, the Ukrainians started uh, have started uh, creation of another defense line on the line uh, recently on the line of Areha Vasilikha, Grigorievka, Kalinovka, Bogdanovka, Chasovyar. So this is the uh, next defense line that Ukrainians are planning to hold. I don't think that Ukrainians are able to hold this bridgehead for a very long time because to support this line they need to cross the channel uh, that goes from Chasovyar to uh, Nikolaev, you can see this on the map, this line, this is the channel and there are not much places where you, you are able to cross this, where you can cross this channel. So that's why if the Russians, as soon as the Russians establish fire control over the, cro over the 
over these places over these intersections uh they will be able to take control over this land but for now the russians are very far from this area and now let's return back to bakhmut furthermore the ukrainians reported that as soon as they left Yagodne, this village uh, on the north of Bakhmut, Bakhmut, they moved to the industrial zone on the north of Bakhmut and uh, they destroyed the dam on the north, this one. Let's take a look at the Institute of Study of War map. map. You see that uh, this dam is located on the hill of 182 meters. And uh, let's say when talking about uh, this uh, small, this uh, residential area on the north, like Yagodne, like... Uh, this uh, railroad station Stupki, this area is located in the lowlands, 92 meters and something like this. So the water from this water reservoir moved to the north and uh, the Russians, I believe that Ukrainians are trying to slow down the Russians as much as possible. And now the Russians have not just the barriers uh, like uh, towns, villages, uh, buildings, now they have a water barrier as well. I, I believe that Ukrainians won another two or three days with this action, maybe even one day, who knows, but anyway, this is this operation, this explosion of the dam is not going to stop the Russian at all. Now let's return back to the Western Sources map and let's update this map according to the current situation. As you can see, this map has been updated, but let's add, uh, add another updates like Dubova Rehova, Dubova Vasilevka is under Russian control, Berkhovka is under Russian control, and Yehidna is under Russian control. So this area area in the north is co under complete Russian control. Let's update this map. It will give us better understanding of the situation. Let's uh, change the color of this territory. So, uh, so this is the this is the north of Bakhmut. As you can see, the town, uh, this dam is destroyed. So the Ukrainians are no longer able to use this dam to support supply north. There is a small, as you can see, the Russians have uh, established control over Yehidne, but there are another one, one kilometer to this area, even a kilometer and a half. So uh, we can say that the Ukrainians, if they are able to stop and slow down the Russians on this land, they still were able to uh, use these uh, local roads through these forests and to support, but they took a decision to destroy this area and they reduced the number of roads they are able to to use to supply and support Bakhmut. That now there are just two ways, N32 road and uh, the road that connects the town by the name of Canal and the small village on the west from Bakhmut, Hromova. But all these roads is under fire control and uh, the losses are very high if the Ukrainians use these roads. The only safe way to support and to move forces from, let's say, Chasofyar to Bakhmut is the uh, small roads, small roads that uh, goes between these two roads, between N32 and these uh, uh, 0506 road. So this small, call, small local roads is the only safe way to use uh, at least to you to um, the infantry are able to use these roads and i believe that infantry uh, uses these roads and the Ra ukrainians uses just these two roads for armored vehicles but there i believe that these days the ukrainians are not sending more armored vehicles inside of bakhmut i believe that uh, that if there are any if there are some number of uh, armored vehicles inside of bakhmut i believe that ukrainians have already took a decision to leave it there and to fight till the last, uh, I don't know, Ukrainian in this Bakhmut or something like this. Furthermore, the Russians are saying that Ukrainians are not planning to give up. They're not planning to step back from this area. They're fight. They're, they're fighting. And uh, so this is very... Uh, so anyway, as I understand, even if the Russians are able to encircle Bakhmut to take control of Hromova, I believe that they will be forced and they will have to storm Bakhmut and we are going to see the clashes inside of Bakhmut. I believe that during the previous months, the Ukrainians managed to move as much as possible ammo, uh, shells, uh, equipment and so on. And I believe that Bakhmut are able to hold the blockade and the storm for another one or two months. It's exactly the time that Ukraine Ukrainians need to uh, continue to complete mobilization process, to complete regrouping, and to start their greatest Ukrainian offensive operation. Now let's talk, try to understand and analyze uh, the uh, next Russian steps in this area. And as I understand, the thing that the Russians are planning to do within the next days is to develop the bridgehead. Uh, around the uh, Dubovo Vasilyevka and uh, around, uh, let's, let's say, 
um, Yahidna and furthermore to reach this, uh, this uh, river, this small river. As soon as the level of the water will go down, goes down, the Russians will continue movement and they will establish control over the north part of Bakhmut and they will reach the outskirts of this residential area. So this is the Russians' plans for the next uh, few days. Let's color this territory in yellow for now this area is under Ukrainian control but I believe that within the next few days the Ukrainians will be forced to step back from this area one more time about the south area the Russians need no matter the losses and no matter nothing they need to establish control over Ivanovska from uh, yesterday we colored this territory in black as a gray zone but I believe that it is better to color this territory in yellow because this town is under complete Ukrainian control this territory not the entire territory uh, the south one the south forest is under Russians uh, the north one is under Ukrainian but anyway let's color this in yellow uh, furthermore the Ukrainians expect that with Within the next few days, the Russians will start offensive operation in the direction of Slavyansk from the bridgehead. Of, uh, so to, to, to say uh, that they're planning to attack Slavyansk is like a very big words. I believe that they will just try to improve their bridgehead on the north. And uh, the Russians will try to establish control over Vasikovka, Zaliznyansk, Areha, Vasilivka. And they will try to reach the outskirts of the, to, they reach the bank of these channels. So this is the things. The, exactly the thing that the Russians will try to achieve during the next few days. For now, this territory is under Russian control, and this is not an easy job. You need to understand this, but the Russians they need to attack no matter the losses. The thing is that. As we discussed many times on the uh, Institute of Study of War map, the Russians establish control over the lowland. They control every single square of the lowlands and the Ukrainians control the hills that uh, encircle this lowland. Let's take a look at this map. This Vasikovka, there is a small hill, 200 meters, but in comparison with the Russians, 160 meters, that's 30 meter, meters difference. Now let's talk Zaliznyanska, Arekhova, Vasilyevka, 241 meters, 247 meters. So, as you can see, the di difference with the Russians' position is around 30 meter, another 30 meters. The Russians entered Dubovo-Vasilivka, Dubo but the Ukrainians stepped back in direction of uh, Grigorivka, and there is another hill, 223 um, meters. So, the difference is around 20 meters. In the same situation on the south, the Russians uh, are trying to attack Ivanovska, but they are uh, they're stopped and blocked by the hills of 256 and 242. So as you can see, the situation is not very easy. And the Russians, when talking about the this part, the Russians understand the Ukrainians are not going, are not able to hold this area for a very long time. But when talking about the north, about the line between Vosikovka, uh, Zaliznyanska, Rekha, Vasilivka, every single day the Ukrainians are moving more and more engineering constructions, engineering equipment, and they're building fortification in this area. In the if the Russians waste another day or another week, the Ukrainians are able to prepare such a powerful fortifications and the Russians will be forced to take this, to spend even months to, uh, not even a single, uh, one month they will have to spend to penetrate this area, so that's why they need to develop to take these hills and after that it will be much more easier for them to continue their offensive operation. When we are talking about the deployment map, well, we need to understand that this is not an easy job as well. Uh, as you can see, according to this map, this hill is under protection of 4th tank brigade, under you know, 17th tank brigade, there are uh, 30th mechanized brigade, there is 100th defense brigade. Furthermore, uh, the C Russians are saying that there is also the 10th mountain assault brigade, some parts of this brigade is uh, are de deployed on this line. So this is not an easy job and uh, I believe that Ukrainian forces on the north, let's say in this area, is much more far powerful than those forces that deployed these days in Bakhmut. So the Russians need to take a decision, they need to have some plan and then they need to develop uh, their offensive operation in these three directions. Uh, the easiest one is the area on the south from Berkhoho Yagidna, this one. And the Russians need just to develop, to move, to establish control over the forest lines, to get this forest that located between Hromova and, let's say, Yahidne. And then this is going to be, let's call it, tactical encirclement of Bakhmut from the north. Uh, they need to increase the pressure from the south, and after that we're going to talk about encirclement. But encirclement of Bakhmut is not the end of the story. It will be at the end of this chapter, and then we're going to open another book of Bakhmut's story, 
by the name of the Storm Operation or Blockade of Bakhmut, because even around 2000 of Ukrainians in Bakhmut inside that the Bakhmut are able to hold some parts of this town for many many months, for many many months, so this is going to be another story. Furthermore, as you can see, they will have support from Grigorivka, Bogdanovka, all these, these defense lines from Chasovyar, and don't forget that this town is located on the hill and they can make very nice assist, very nice support of these forces inside of Bakhmut with artillery, with drones and so on. So to take Bakhmut is another chapter and this is not an easy job anyway. But I believe that the Russians are able to do this um, because um, we are talking about the hills, about the situation, about the forces, but don't forget about the spirits of the warriors. I believe that uh, sometimes uh, I don't think that the soldiers, even if they're so, they have so such a perfect support they have such a perfect position if they see that they're encircled i believe that uh, the uh, the um, i don't know the uh, their wish to fight will be reduced to zero so this is the, we also need to count this and to understand this and i believe that this is exactly that the russians want they want to encircle to and to reduce the spirit and the will of ukrainians and bakhmut to fight and to force them to surrender of course they will promise them everything the Russians have very nice uh, experience in the past with Azov and I believe that they will try to explain to Ukrainians inside the Bakhmut that they, are no, they won't be killed, that they will be, maybe even in the, in the future they will be, there is going to be a big exchange process and they will return back home, back home. so there is no need to die for nothing just, so I believe that the story of Bakhmut soon will be, will be uh, solved by the Russians. When talking about Donetsk, the Russians reported Donetsk frontline that Ukrainians lost 120 soldiers, three armored vehicles and two artillery systems, the 20 and the 30 howitzer. So as you can see, the level of ro losses in comparison with the yesterday has, uh, has been reduced from 240 to 120 and I believe that that mainly connected with the fact that the Russians these the previous 24 hours were doing clearing operation of Yagidne, Dubovo, Vasilivka, Berkhovka, there wasn't uh, weren't a lot of active offensive operations, uh, active attacks in this area, and uh, they were trying just to prepare the bridgehead and to prepare uh, not just the bridgehead to defense and to for further offensive operation. I believe that the previous 24 hours was just uh, artillery duels day when the artillerists were attacking the Ukrainians all over the front line, uh, also in Bakhmut as well. Now let's move to the south and let's talk about Avdiivka, the front line from the Russian uh, side started movement. There are a lot of interesting movements in the vicinity of Avdiivka. Let's return back to the Russian sources map. As you can see, there are a lot of updates in this area and let's discuss them one by one. First of all, when talking about Pesky frontline, Pesky bridgehead, the Russians managed to develop their bridgehead from this road. This road the Russians were using to supply and support their forces in Vadyane. And as a result of offensive operation, the Russians managed to push the Ukrainians back from these fields to uh, other lines, to the rest lines, uh, to the final line in this area that's still under Ukrainian control to this one. The Russians control this area. Furthermore, as a result of storming operation and heavy clashes and Vadyana bridgehead, the Russians established control over these trenches and over these trenches. And these uh, are the most important trenches and fortifications in this area. Let's return back to the Institute of Study of War map. Um, this is Pieski and this is exactly the hills that the Russians got control over. This is the highest positions in this area, 224 meters, 232 meters. Uh, this is exactly these two trenches. The Russians got control over them and now the Russians control the highest position on this front line. I'm not talking about the entire, let's say about the Pesky Avdeevka bridgehead. I'm not talking about the north because there are higher, mm, a bigger hill in this area, this one. But when talking about this part, the west part of Avdeevka, the Russians control the highest position in this area. Uh, these two hills. So they developed their offensive, they developed their bridgehead. Furthermore, when talking about the east part of Avdeevka, today we received the report that the Russians established control not just over Novobakhmutovka. There was, we discussed this situation a few days ago. Furthermore, the Russians established control over this forest. We discussed this forest just maybe two or three videos ago. And the Russians, uh, let's say, 
um, got the outskirts of Krasnogorovka. So they, we can say that there was some kind of offensive operation. P the Russians managed to penetrate the Ukrainian defense orders and they developed their bridgehead on the north uh, east of Avdiivka significantly. So let's take a look at this map. First of all, Avdiivka. Let's update this map according to the uh, these updates we have right now. So according to the Russian sources, they managed to develop the bridgehead something like this, and they controlled this. Uh, uh, maybe not this one. Let's take a look one more time because it's very important to understand. Yes, this line, the line between, there is just one line left between Severna and the Russian position. So I, I'm talking about this line. So this line is under Ukrainian control and the south line is under Russian control. So the situation right now in Oputna is something like this. The Russians controls develop their bridgehead and now they are able to establish fire, fire and visible vision control over and the towns that located on the north, Toninka, Severna, Lastochkina. So the Ukrainians in Severna is under fire and they understand this well and uh, the situation for them is critical. The entire situation for Avdivka is critical. But uh, when talking about just this, this development, the situation we can say plus minus critical, but not so critical. But today also the Russians reported, and as you can see, the Western source map has been updated as well, that the Russians developed their bridgehead and they got the outskirts of Krasnogorovka. So that means that the Russians uh, now controls something like this. It's approximately, I'm not sure about the real borders of their bridgehead in this area, but uh, there was a few maps, a few pictures that were showing this exactly this configuration of the front line in this area. So this is it. As you can see, situation for Avdiivka becomes becomes more and more critical, and uh, the Russians are saying that they're using bombs in this area, Fab 500s. This is very powerful bombs. I don't know how the Russians uh, uses these bombs. Maybe they're flying above Avdiivka. Maybe they are able to cor correct the bomb and to attack Avdiivka with a, within a distance or something like this. But the thing, the most, the most important thing is that the Russians started movement uh, to encircle Avdiivka as well. Uh, the thing that they need to do to be uh, like successful, they need to establish control over Piromaiska anyway. So this is the most important town that still uh, this uh, blue cloud still under Ukrainian control. Uh, and if the Russians are able to do this, they will achieve one important uh, benefit. They will be able to attack uh, Toninka and Severna from the west. As you can see, and as far as possible from Avdiivka, because the area between Severin and Lastochkina, Avdiivka, this small area, is under complete Ukrainian control, and to attack uh, using this flank attack is like suicide operation. The only possible solution is to move to the west and to try to attack this town from the west, from the west flank. And uh, as we can see, the Russians uh, achieved a lot of benefits by taking these hills. Now they control this area around. They can um, navigate and uh, correct and target artillery system. And now they have more benefits and they are able to develop their offensive op operation further. And there, are, there were no updates about uh, Marienka. There are still heavy clashes. Uh, the Russians were stepped back from Pabeda. They established their positions along these forest lines. And I believe that they prepared themselves for another step, another attempt of offensive operation in the direction of Pabeda. Now we are on the South Donetsk front line. The Minister of Defense of Russian Federation reported that during the previous 24 hours, the, Ukrainian lost, the Ukrainians lost 90 soldiers, 9 armored vehicles, including 3 tanks and 2 artillery systems, one Stabi Hovitzer and another D-20 Hovitzer. Furthermore, the Ukrainians lost two uh, um, warehouses, one in, in direction inside of Vuglidar, somewhere in the vicinity of Vuglidar, and another one somewhere in the vicinity of Malinovka, this town that like it in the Zaporozhye area. Furthermore, the Russians, as we discussed uh, in the beginning of this video, activated their movements uh, in the vicinity of Vuglidar one more time. And the thing is that the Russians managed to move and deploy their the most powerful artillery systems with 240 mm shells and 204 mm shells. So it's the most powerful artillery system in the world. And this artillery systems serves just for one purpose, to ruin the buildings.
So I believe that the Russians were trying to save this town, small town. Maybe they had some plans for this town. Maybe they were, they thought to they wanted to use this uh, small town Nugledar as the bridgehead for further offensive operation in direction of Kurahova. But as a result of January offensive operation, the Russians were defeated. Uh, they managed to develop their bridgehead. We can't say that they were defeated because they achieved some success. They got more territory. They developed their bridgehead but they haven't established control over Uglidar and now the Russians moved their powerful artillery systems and I believe that they took a decision to to ruin Uglidar because they understand that they are no longer able to establish control over this town I believe you saw a lot of videos a lot of photos from Uglidar as you can see maybe if you are able to see this uh, this town is completely under fire the Russians are burning this town they're trying to not just destroy I believe that they want not just to reduce this town till ground they want to reduce till this town till underground or uh, and few meters underground I don't know but situation there is critical I don't know about the situation with the civilians uh, a few weeks ago we discussed that the Russians started some evacuation process I I hope and I want to believe that there are no more civilians in this town and I believe that within the next few weeks we are going to see that there are, there are no more ugly dar on the map as well so this is about the south Donetsk front line uh, there are no changes on uh, zaporozhye the, the only things that the russians destroyed few uh, uh, one ammo depot in this area and that's it and when talking about uh, Kherson, the russians reported that as a result of clashes during the previous 24 hours the ukrainians lost three artillery systems one m777 howitzer and two kvazdika howitzers in this area so as you can see, the Russians have activated their movements all over the front line, on the Kupins front line, on Liman front line, on Donetsk front line, on South Donetsk front line. There are just two uh, areas where the Russians are not moving at all. I'm talking about Kherson, and we can understand why, and Zaporozhye. Uh, maybe th within the next weeks we're going to see some activation of Zaporozhye, but for now we see what we see. Another important update are coming from Belarus. Uh, first of all, the Ukrainians took a decision to increase the um, the um, the mine fields, the the width of mine field on the border with Belarus for another two kilometers. So they have completely mined everything on this border, and they I believe the Ukrainians are afraid of. Uh, any offensive operation from the Belarus side, so they just want to, to be on the safe side, they just want to be secured, and they just increase this situation. But this is not the important update I'm trying now. I want to discuss about the Belarus on the 28th of uh, February till the I believe 3rd of March. The president of Belarus are, is going to fly to China for some kind of uh, interesting negotiation between the president of Belarus and the leader of China. They will discuss something. There are a lot of talks, a lot of rumors about this situation but i believe that at least these guys want to solve at least two things the first one is that as you know that every single border uh um, border uh Mm, every single border passage in this area are blocked by poland by lithuania by latvia so now there are no way to use cargoes trucks uh, i don't know to cross the border and to move the goods from let's say kazakhstan from the Kazakhstan to Europe and there are, and this situation caused a lot of problems for at least Kazakhstan maybe you know that the uh, the Minister of Internal Affairs of Kazakhstan um, made some kind of protest to Poland uh, asking them to open the borders because the Kazakhstan manufacturers uh, have a lot of losses because of the situation that they can't cross the border so I believe that and as you know there are a lot of investments in Kazakhstan from China and there are a lot of people who connected Furthermore, there are a lot of China pro Chinese project in Belarus and Russia, and of course they need uh, like uh, secured and stable passage in this area. So that's why there there was something like this. And maybe this is the topic that these two leaders are planning to discuss. Maybe the uh, Xi Jinping, the China leader, had a solution, have a solution, and the only thing that he need is to ask the president of Belarus to follow the uh, to follow the situation, to follow his needs, and not to. Uh, increase the pressure on the border this is the first thing another the second thing is that i believe it's my completely my understanding situation as you know western countries are saying that china is going to uh, start supporting russia with the weapon 
and the United States of America are saying about sanctions, about that China are going to have a lot of problems with this. And we understand that United States of America are going to make some sanctions and so on. We discussed the situation with China a few weeks ago when I told you that they are going to join the special operation. And I believe that China leader found the solution how to, from one side, to help Russia, to support Russia, to, uh, to develop a Chinese weapon, and from the other side, not to get under sanctions. And the thing is that when talking about Belarus, the a lot of Chinese projects in, in, in this in this country, a lot of industrial zone manufacturers, plants and so on. And I believe that Chinese leader took a decision to create more um, plants on the territory of Belarus and to use the territory of Belarus to produce the Chinese weapon. I'm talking about the main, we understand that what is the most important China can support Russia is drones, a significant number of drones. So I believe that this is another thing that they will, will discuss how to use Belarus as the main uh, area to produce weapon for Russia and uh, they want to create a situation when the Chinese won't be connected anywhere with this country but from the other side all these uh, manufacturers all these plants will be completely under Chinese control so this is my understanding of this situation but anyway I believe that we'll see this very soon and another thing that means that the Russians and uh, the Western countries are planning to continue offensive operation and something tells me that we are not going to see the end of this this war within this year maybe the next year but not today because just uh, China is going to start and that means that they need another six months to create the infrastructure and after that uh, at least they need a year to test to develop and so on so I don't think that this war is going to be finished within this year and that's it for today military summary channel reminds you can the many violence in Ukraine thank you for watching subscribe to my channel put your likes join my patreon and have a good day bye bye